Hi, this is Mr. Smalley, and today we are going to be talking about what's in this jar. Uh, I know you can't really see, but inside this jar there are actually thousands of tiny little creatures. And uh, they're really, really cool, so I want to talk to you about them today. Um, I'm actually not the first person to discuss these creatures. At the turn of the 16th century, there was a guy by the name of Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek, who was an early person to uh, use a microscope to look at these things. He called them animacules because they were like tiny little animals. And um, as we've progressed, um, we've termed these creatures protozoa. Protozoa comes from uh, two root words, the first of which is going to be proto. Proto means first and zoa. Zoa kind of sounds like zoo or zoology and that means animals. So what we are referring to when we're talking about these animals, protozoa, are the very first animals. Um, so are these things animals? The first thing I want to address is that they're really not animals. They do have many similar characteristics, but not all of their characteristics are exactly the same. Um, so first of all, we'll look at their cellularity. Um, animals are all multicellular. They're going to be larger. There's very, very few animals that you couldn't see uh, with the naked eye. I actually can't think of any. Um, protozoa, on the other hand, are unicellular. Um, and they're very, very small. Every once in a while, you will find a couple of these protozoa that have colonized um, a little area together. So they're called colonial organisms. And sometimes you can even see some of them, uh, but they're very tiny. They're unicellular uh, by and large. Next thing, animals all have specialized tissues. Uh, this means that they have different areas of their body that perform different functions. Protozoa, on the other hand, are just unicellular, so they have no true tissues, so they're not similar in this way. This next term is uh, going to be a sort of a compound word. The first part, hetero, means other. And then the word trophic is energy. So, you might say, well, what does that mean? This is going to be something like a wolf that gets its energy from another organism, say a deer. Um, all animals consume other uh, organisms. It could be an other animals or plants for their energy. Um, protozoa, on the other hand, are going to be heterotrophic or possibly uh, autotrophic. Auto means self. If I can squeeze that in, self. So they actually make their energy themselves. Now that's going to be something like a plant. Um, so this is sort of a, a strange thing. Some protozoa can actually um, eat other organisms as well as make their own energy. We'll talk about one of those in a second here. Um, one of the ways that these things are similar is that they can move. So they both can move. If you look in a jar or something, you can actually see these things swimming around. Um, and the final way that these things are, compare is going to be their reproduction. Animals are almost all going to reproduce sexually. Um, there's a couple of you know, species like lizards and jellyfish that um, don't necessarily need sexual reproduction to carry on, um, but they almost all do. Um, protozoa, on the other hand, are just by and large asexually going to reproduce. I'll talk about one case where that isn't true. So there's a couple um, caveats here, but um, really, by and large, these things don't add up. They're not really animals. Well, that sort of begs the question, what are they? For a long time, uh, the proteists, which is going to be all of uh, these organisms right here, uh, were basically lumped together into the biological junk drawer. People didn't know how to classify them. Um, since that time, um, a lot of DNA analysis has led to really exciting discoveries about how these things are related. Um, so this is sort of a complicated um, way to analyze these things. It's, it's a little bit beyond the scope of an introductory zoology course, 
or biology course. Um, so, you know, you might go through this in college. For my purposes, I'm actually going to use an older way of classifying these things, which is to look at the way that these things move. So, um, let's go through real quick. I want to describe the way that um, three example organisms move. The first one that uses an organelle for movement is called flagella. Uh, this comes from a Latin word that means whip. So it basically whips its hair back and forth, kind of like Willow Smith, and actually is able to propel itself through the water doing that. Uh, the next one, cilia. It basically has microscopic oars or hairs that run down the length of its body and beat, kind of like a Viking warship pushing through the water. And the f final one, pseudopod. Pseudo means false. And pod means foot. So um, this is a false foot, and it sort of moves in a really strange way. Let's so see if you can figure out where these things are going to go. And we'll talk about our example organisms here. So you might have guessed it. The flagella is going to be this long structure right here that's wiggling back and forth. That's going to be found on an organism called the euglena. Cilia is uh, going to be found on an organism called the paramecium and it's basically going to be wiggling those hairs back and forth and moving through the water. Pseudopods are found on amoebas. So this is a, a picture of an amoeba capturing prey here and moving its pseudopod. It's kind of one of the strangest uh, forms of movement I've ever seen. So let's, let's take a look a little bit closer at um, these amoebas to start out and we'll see what we can figure out about them. Amoebas um, the way I start to think about this is kind of like a water balloon. Um, with a water balloon on the inside, what you have um, is sort of that fluid. Um, in this, it's going to be called endoplasm. Endo means inside, and plasm is sort of like gel. On the outside, going around the entire organism, is going to be a little bit more rigid of a um, layer. This is called the ectoplasm. Ecto means outside. Plasm, again, is kind of like a gel. Uh, but we'll take a, a couple more looks at things around here. Uh, first of all, one of the most important things is a nucleus. Um, this basically houses all of the DNA for the whole organism. So the DNA is going to be housed in here, um, and that really helps the organism to replicate structures it needs. The next one is the contractile vac vacuole. Um, since these things are living in water, um, a lot of times what's going to happen is water is actually going to flow into the endoplasm, and this uh, contractile vacuole actually transports water out of the organism so it doesn't swell up too much. Um, another thing you're going to notice is a food vacuole. So this thing is going to be carrying food and digesting it, sort of like a stomach, um, but a lot tinier. Um, finally, this whole structure here, um, we're going to take a little bit closer look at it. This whole structure is called a pseudopod the false foot, and um, there's two parts that I want you to learn about, the fountain zone and the hyaline cap. And so let's take a closer look at um, that pseudopod here. This is really how amoebas eat, it's how they move, um, and it's, it's pretty complicated. I'll briefly talk about it right here. Essentially what's happening is um, back here you have the endoplasm that is actually going to be streaming up um, the foot. And as it reaches the end layer here, it's going to become hard. And that's going to form this thing called a hyaline cap. It's really going to be forming an ectoplasm. So the endoplasm flows and becomes a hard layer called the ectoplasm, um, which is going to form this hyaline cap all around the outside. 
Um, so there's these tiny little uh, tubes or structures, kind of like straws or Legos or something. Um, they're, called, they're made out of actin. They bind together and um, sort of form this lattice work that has, it's kind of like a scaffold that makes the outside of the pseudopod hard. And um, this is going to be our fountain zone right here, this flowing endoplasm. Um, it's it's going to be sh sort of shooting um, this fluid up and around the sides of the, the foot here. So um, that's a really cool structure to look at about how these things are actually eating. Uh, next, it's really, these things are kind of important in the history of um, biology because they kind of give us an example of how it could be possible that an organism could um, gain new organelles, for instance, uh, chloroplast or nucleus. So there's this really great theory of endosymbiosis. Um, basically what's going on with this is it's describing how organisms can incorporate another organism into their body. Um, so some protozoa at, at some point engulfed photosynthetic bacteria and these became chloroplasts. Um, so what that would have looked like would have been sort of a scenario like this. You have an amoeba and it's going to move its pseudopod. Um, it's going to flow down that fountain zone uh, into the hyaline cap. It's going to wrap itself around a photosynthetic bacteria and then it's going to absorb that. Um, and they are going to basically store that chloroplast in their body and it's going to become a source of energy for them because it goes through photosynthesis and makes them energy. Um, it's also thought that protozoa engulfed anaerobic bacteria which eventually became mitochondria and helped those, those uh, protozoa to get energy for their body. Uh, macrophages. So one of the strangest things is if you actually look inside the human body, um, it's sort of like we have these things that are uh, human amoeba. They're called macrophages. So we'll take a look at what this looks like. Um, and so what you're going to see here is one of these um, amoebas is going to be going after this guy right here. This is a little bit of algae and it's going to eat it all up and it finds a couple more and eats them up and absorbs them into um, its body in a food vacuole. So what's really crazy about this is that it's sort of just amazing that uh, we actually have amoebas sort of living in us um, and they're actually part of our body. Um, ne next, we'll look at the euglena. The euglena has uh, a lot of the same structures. Of course, on the inside, it's going to have endoplasm. Then it's going to actually have something that's really hard to see in this diagram, but wrapping around its entire body is a uh, thin ectoplasm. So this blue layer is going to be ectoplasm. And then around that, there's actually this uh, hard casing that's called a pellicle. And it's sort of like putting a water balloon um, inside of a plastic cup or something to keep it protected. Um, so this pellicle is wrapping all around um, the body of this euglena, keeping it safe, and it's sort of just this protective layer. Again, they're going to have a nucleus, which is going to be where their DNA is. They're going to also have a stigma. Um, this is a red spot at the very, um, I'll say, front of their body, where it actually can absorb different wavelengths of light, and that's really helpful if you're photosynthetic. Um, so this is sort of like the eye of a um, euglena, you can see out of here. Um, this is going to be its flagella, 
the flagella is going to be what helps it to propel through. It also has a contractile vacuole, which is going to um, help it to take water out of its body. Um, and then finally, what's really cool is this thing has some chloroplasts in it. Chloroplasts are actually able to undergo photosynthesis and make energy for this organism. So it's an autotroph, and it's actually able to eat as well, so it's a heterotroph. It's kind of got plant and animal-like characteristics. Very strange. Um, now, one of the things that's really, really cool about uh, these organisms, if, if I'm going to build a euglena here, so um, I'll go ahead and draw one. So there's the pellicil. And then here's my flagella. Um, I'll draw in a nucleus and a stigma. And then I've also got to give it a couple chloroplasts throughout its body. And I don't want to forget my contractile vacuole, otherwise this thing might die. Um, now, what's really cool is if I look at this uh, tail, this flagella, and I take a cross-section of this thing um, and blow it up. So I'm going to sort of cut it through like a pancake and, and take a closer look at it. What I'm going to see is a structure that kind of looks like this. This is called a 9 to arrangement. So what you have here is nine, you can count them, one, let me use a different color, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine outside um, tubes that are running down the length of this flagella and two, one, two, <laughs> Um, inside tubes that are running down the length of this flagella. Now, what's really, really strange about this, this is a euglena. And if we were to look at our early cells, this is going to be a uh, human sperm. Um, what you would find is that we actually have um, the same structure within our very own flagella. So it's kind of a strange thing to think about, um, but humans have some of the same structures that are in euglenas, and um, this actually is evidence that supports the theory of evolution because uh, humans and very old organisms share some of the exact same characteristics, which is what we would expect to find if they came from a common ancestor. Humans, uh, you know, did, didn't exactly come straight from a euglena. They came from a common ancestor that euglena and humans share, and it's pretty hard to determine exactly what that would have looked like a long time ago. Um, now let's look at the paramecium. Um, so this thing has a lot of really cool structures. Right away we can tell that on the inside it has its endoplasm, that's the goo in here. Uh, the ectoplasm is going to be wrapping around the outside. Uh, the first thing you might notice when you look at this is that it's covered in tons of cilium. Um, these are going to be those tiny rowing oars that actually, this is a close up, you can see they're able to beat and pulsate and move it through the water. Um, they also have these tiny things called trichocysts, which can sort of shoot out like a harpoon, and um, it's thought that these things can actually barb different creatures. It's like a harpoon that will just shoot out if the organism is attacked. So that's pretty cool. Um, they have a contractile vacuole. Again, that's going to be helping to transport water out of the organism so that it doesn't get too much water in it, sort of like our bladder, if you will think of it that way. Um, and it has this mouth part right here. Um, so that's going to be its oral groove. Um, it's going to form a food vacuole. 
Finally, uh, there's a micronucleus and a macronucleus. Uh, now, the micronucleus is going to be used for sexual reproduction, and the macronucleus is going to be used to create um, structures that are used in everyday functioning of a paramecium. Let's take a closer look at one of these paramecium. Okay, here's a paramecium feeding. Uh, this is a video by a guy named Craig Smith who has uh, done some just real incredible uh, video work. Um, what it shows here is the outside um, of a paramecium that's covered in uh, pellicil. I didn't mention earlier, but paramecium are actually covered in a hard layer. It's called a pellicil, just like a euglena. Um, and out of that is going to be all these tiny cilia. If you look closely, you can actually see them uh, rowing through the water. And what you see here is a oral groove. And this also has tiny cilia that are beating. And as they beat, they sort of sweep food into the mouth of this paramecium. So uh, food is going to be traveling from outside down through this gullet into uh, what we call a food vacuole. So here's our food vacuole and eventually that's going to disattach and uh, since this thing is heterotrophic it's going to be absorbing nutrients into its body. So let's take a look at this food vacuole actually um, di disattaching from the uh, uh, oral groove and this thing can just continue to eat in this way. Okay, I want to talk to you about how these things reproduce. Um, first of all, there's two different ways that these things reproduce asexually. The bottom three examples here show fission Fission is basically when you take one thing and split it into two smaller particles. Uh, in this case, um, you can see here, for example, this trip trypanosoma, which is what causes malaria, um, is going to actually split into two new organisms. So it's one creature that splits into two new organisms, and it's going to um, therefore reproduce in that way. Same thing is true with the euglena, it just splits in two and it's going to form two new organisms, or this guy right here. So um, the other possibility for how these things can reproduce asexually is called budding. And in budding, what something's going to do is you're going to have a larger uh, sort of mother creature and she's going to have a little bud that actually sort of drops off of her. So you can sort of see that happening here. Uh, this lady, she's kind of growing a little um, bud and then this is actually going to eventually grow up and uh, come away from her. They're not male or female, I'm just using that as a figure of speech. Okay, now one of the ways that some of these creatures are like animals is that they're actually able to undergo sexual reproduction. So what I have here is two paramecium, and paramecium have a big macronucleus which takes care of everyday needs for the uh, organism to produce what it needs to, and it has a micronucleus. Now when these two things bump together, uh, what's going to happen is they're going to start doing some crazy things, the first of which is to kill off their macronucleus. So the macronucleus dies, and the next thing that's going to happen is these things are going to start going through meiosis. So this uh, little micronucleus is going to split into two, and then it's actually going to split into two again. This would be meiosis two. And so the process here is actually um, going to form four new products that each have um, half the number of genes that the original one did. So this, these ones are gone. They just kind of split apart. And um, the same thing is going to happen in 
uh, this paramecium over here. So it's going to go through meiosis 1, and now it's going through meiosis 2, and it's going to form four micronuclei. Obviously the old ones are dead. Now this is really strange. What happens at this point is that all but one of these four products is actually killed off. And then this one splits again kind of strange. And this one's going to split again. Now, um, this is going to send over one of its micronuclei to this side, and this one is going to send over one of its micronuclei from this side. So, what you have is uh, these two things are going to fuse and form a new macronuclei. Okay, so I'll cross out this. Cross out this. One little blue guy here. And then here's a new macronuclei. So these new macronuclei are a lot more genetically stable. They have new genes that might be able to help them survive in a new environment. And uh, this is a great step in the history of evolutionary biology to be able to undergo sexual reproduction. It's kind of a strange story, but um, it's, it's pretty cool. So, all right, the final thing I really need to talk about is how this affects health from people all around the world. Basically, this starts when people are in contact with areas that are not very sanitary. So if this is a person here, um, they're going to come in contact with something that's really, really nasty here in just about a second. This is called a cyst. What a cyst is, is a protozoan that has wrapped itself in a tight layer around its body. That's going to protect it from things like heat, salt, water, drying out. The cyst keeps this protozoan all alive, sort of like hibernating until a time when it can actually become uh, in the presence of favorable conditions. That might happen when it goes into your body. So if I have this cyst and it goes into your body, goes into your stomach, um, what can happen is it will actually come out of that cyst-like form. It will exit that cyst-like form. So this process that I have here in red is called excystment coming out of the cyst. Um, after that, when it leaves your body, uh, it's possible that some of these offspring are going to go back into a cyst, and when they come out in the feces of a person, uh, they're going back into the cyst form. So going into the cyst form, in cystment, coming out of the cyst form, so coming out, it's going to be excystment. This is a problem in places um, where people are taking care of each other. So if you have a person who um, is maybe working at a daycare or working at a hospital or a nursing home, when they come in contact with someone else's feces, it's possible that those cysts inside there can get in their body and wreak havoc on their health as well. Okay, one of the worst ways that this plays out in humans is in the example of malaria. So this is a diagram of malaria and its life cycle, um, the life cycle of the protozoan that causes it. It's called plasmodium. And these things actually alternate between being cyst-like forms and sort of being in their normal um, protozoan looking stage. Um, now this has a huge effect across the earth. In 2012 the World Health Organization estimated that 216 million cases of malaria occurred in the world and a staggering 655 million people um, were estimated to have died in 2012. So 
really understanding protozoa is critical for the future of humankind in order to stop how these things are working and, and killing people. So I hope that this lesson has been helpful in terms of coming to understand how these things work, what their bodies are like, and um, they're really cool to look at, and they're also really important for humans to understand. So I hope that this has been a good lesson for you, and thanks for tuning in.